Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is so exciting to see this room so full of people, particularly on a rainy night and after so many winter storms, but we do need the rain, we know that. So um, what is it brought us all here together? I think we know the answer to that. It is the cypress snowy owl. That bird, since it arrived, has transfixed the city of Cyprus, Orange County, Southern California, and way beyond. The interest in this amazing bird is so exciting and so inspiring. And I know we're all looking forward to learning more about this bird this evening. My name is Gail Richards. I am president of CNC Audubon. And it is one of the largest chapters in the whole network, national network of National Audubon Societies. We have over 3000 members. And that is one of the reasons that we were able to help with the publicity of this event because we have a uh, listserv of 4,600 people that we can send out a notice to in a minute. And that helped a little bit, but we got help from a lot of other people. Um, Brendan Ortiz, Brendan, it was over here at the table. Where are you, Brendan? Right there, Brendan was uh, made this amazing flyer that we sent out to all the chapters of, uh, or Audubon chapters of Southern California. And it was sent to all of the contacts from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department. So, and then we also had Roy Rausch with his Roy. His Facebook page on the Cypress Snowy Owl, and he now has how many contacts, Roy? Twenty-one hundred people have developed a passion for this gorgeous bird that came to visit us, at least, right? We do have a distinguished guest with us this evening, Anne Hertz Millari is the mayor of the city of Cyprus. Thank you, you for joining us. And I think there's a council member here. Yes, also, I was told not to name people, so I, would you like to tell us your name? That's fine, okay, anyway, thank you for coming. <laughs> okay. Seth Borde on January 2nd, shortly after the owl arrived, gave me a phone call. She is the environmental scientist and the research reserve manager at Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve. And she said that we had the opportunity to bring Denver Holt, a leading research scientist for the Owl Institute. And particularly, he lives in Montana and he's been studying the snowy owl for many years. And you'll hear more about that in a little while but we could bring him to Orange County. And she asked me if CNSH Audubon would sponsor this. And after I checked with my board of directors and my conservation team, I was able to give her an enthusiastic yes, so we would do that. So once we said yes, we would do it, then we had to find a place because we don't have any place at CNSH that's this big. And we were expecting an enormous audience. And right now we have way over 300 people in this audience. And how many on the webinar at this time? Five hundred and seventeen people are watching this on a webinar, and the, the reason that we were able to produce a webinar, a webinar, is because Kenny Perez and Stephen Bell, sorry, I forgot Stephen's last name, were able to do the magic to make this a webinar in addition to just they thought her speaking around. Love the table. Okay, as you came in, there was a welcome table from CN Sage out front. And on that welcome table, there is information about the snowy owl as it, there is on this table. There's also information about joining the Audubon Society and first you join national and then they kick you back to whatever chapter is closest to where you live. Um, and then there are, there's a big poster with QR codes on it that are gonna tell you about the upcoming events at CNSH Audubon at, in, this, in the winter months. And it just so happens that before the snowy owl came, we had already planned the year of the owl because tomorrow night we're having a, a Zoom meeting on the conservation of burrowing owls. On February 4th, we're talking about turkey vultures. On February 17th, we have a pre presentation on the conservation of the spotted owl. And early March, we have a two-day workshop by Bill Clark on ident identifying raptors. And on March 11th and 12th, we're doing a a hawk banding activity with Pete Bloom at O'Neill Park. 
And so um, it goes on and we're, we're really proud of the, the work we do and the things we have to offer you. So if you have an interest, stop by on your way out, take a picture of the QR codes and, and connect with us. Um, we are accepting donations to cover some of the costs of the, of the expenses for tonight. And there's a donation owl out there it has a little slot in his head. So if you'd like to drop a dollar in there, that would be appreciated. Do we have dollars anymore? I don't know, anybody carry money? <laughs> okay, at this time, I would like to, to get back to the subject of the snowy owl and introduce Scott Thomas, He's been studying and protecting raptors in Orange County for more than 30 years, working with the chapter and other raptor researchers such as Pete Bloom and Jeff Kidd. He serves at the Sea and Sage Research, uh, I'm sorry, Raptor Research Committee, chairperson, and he's vice chair of our conservation committee. So please welcome Scott Thomas. Good evening, Good evening everybody. Um, it's good to see there's many people coming out to see birds. How many people, just a quick show of hands, are either new or kind of new at doing birds? Good amount. So welcome to being kind of a geek. <laughs> um, raptors are real good for that. I've been studying raptors, in, as she said, in Orange County for about 40 years and doing work with conservation to, to conserve raptors and also to use them as a tool to conserve open space. Um, so I've had a lot of conversations with folks over the years. I've worked in several blue collar fields before I worked in the biology field. And I can tell people I'm going out this weekend to watch birds. And particularly in that blue collar field, people kind of look at you like, yeah, whatever. But if I say I'm going to go with raptors, oh, it changes their mind. I mean, they kill things, you know, and they get excited. So we're really happy that this has done this and created this much enthusiasm. It's great for us too. And all the people who are experienced birders, um, this just really invigorates and reinvigorates um, your um, need to get out and look and see birds and, and protect birds. Um, uh, as I said, we do conservation work from the small end to the big end with raptors. And so while I've got everybody here, I commend everybody and thank everybody. I went a couple of times to see the owl, I had to see it. Um, and also just to kind of check and see how the crowds are doing. And everybody was doing great. People were staying back where they're supposed to be. The crowds were pretty quiet, respecting private property, um, concerned about the owl, asking questions about migration and all the things you'd want to do. So it's really nice. Um, owls in particular can be a little sensitive to a lot of people. This bird and this species less than others, perhaps. And Denver will talk more about that. I may be off a little there, but um, a lot of our owls are really fully nocturnal. They're, they want to be hidden during the day. Um, they don't want people seeing them. So, and, but they're hard to resist if we know where they are to go take a look. So we always try to coach people to you know, keep a good distance. Don't spend a long time. And remember, if an owl's got its eyes open during the day and it's watching you, it's it's doing something it's not supposed to be doing. That's its sleep time, so it's already disturbed. Um, but keep the good distances, be friendly with it. If you can, keep the dogs at home. That's a big threat to uh, all birds, um, even if it's a good dog. They don't know the difference between a good dog on a leash that's sitting and a, and a bad dog that's running or a coyote that's going to eat them. So four-legged creatures are tough on birds, and particularly with owls and hawks. Um, and then please enjoy the night. And I'm going to bring up one more person to talk to you tonight. And that's Melissa, who was a boardy, who, as Gail said, really put this together. It took a village to get it going in two weeks. But Melissa's really been the one doing the work and getting this put up here. Um, she works, as Gail said, for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife at Bolsa Chica. Um, over the past two decades, Melissa has grown great appreciation for raptors. She's dedicated numerous hours to educating others about the magnificent, bir magnificent birds, excuse me, and helping with conservation of their habitats. During the winter of 2012, Melissa spent time with Denver Holt, our speaker tonight, um, as a guest speaker at the Owl Research Institute and assisted in developing their winter raptor survey program. In addition, in 2014, Melissa completed a capstone project with methods for management and conservation in a system and the protection of the declining short aired owl, one of our rare visitors, another rare visitor, Orange County. She's currently pursuing her master's degree at Oregon State University. I'm going to come say a few words and then we'll be done. Melissa? If we're not. No problem. Okay. Hi, everybody. It's so hard to be here tonight. So, um, obviously, I've been really busy. So, I'm going to cheat and read from my speech because I have all of your attention. It's really important that I have so much important things to say. So, 
Good evening, and thank you all for attending tonight's talk um, on Reading Ecology of Snowy Owls by Denver Holt. It's an honor to be here representing uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'd like to thank the Sage Audubon Society for co-sponsoring this event. I could not have done it without you. To my awesome intern, Braden Ortiz, raise your hand again. I know, I know Gail did me thank you, but he really helped me in a lot of ways. Um, Dr. Pete Bloom, who helped identify, we have the owl pellet over there. If you didn't get to see it, make sure you check it out. That is from the snowy owl. We were able to collect it, and he helped determine what it ate, which Denver will talk about in a little bit. And then Jen Brown from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and then my awesome and large CDFW team all around the state. Um, and then, of course, Kenny and Stephen from the Conservancy and Roy Rauch. I also want to give a shout out to you, you again. You really brought the community together. So thank you for doing that. Um, you really had appreciation for the owl and helped others grow appreciation and respect, making sure she was safe and protecting that Facebook page. Um, but over the last month, I've had the opportunity to observe and monitor the snowy owl closely. And during this time, I have heard so many stories and met so many community members who have been captivated by the snowy owl. This unique and rare encounter has clearly inspired curiosity amongst thousands of community members near and far. We are up to 570 now, boys, 570. Awesome, and then all of you guys here. So that's pretty incredible. In fact, even worldwide. So many of you have gained appreciation and formed an emotional connection with this majestic bird. I hope these experiences will inspire you to learn more about our natural world, raptors, and how you can help protect them. Why is it important? I know Scott talked a little bit about this and Denver's probably gonna to touch on it, but raptors play an important ecological role in maintaining a healthy environment, not only for wildlife, but for you too and humans. Really important. And I wanna highlight that. Um, so what are the, the threats to, to raptors? Habitat loss is, a, is an obvious one. So helping protect open spaces, like Scott mentioned, planting native plants, you can have a full ecosystem in your backyard and I promise you will enjoy um, that and also save money. Um, cats also kill billions of birds every year. So making sure you're responsible, responsible pet owner, you can put a big bell on that collar to let that bird know that that cat is looking to eat that bird and hopefully will never eat that bird. Even considering an indoor cat as a pet. Window strikes, you can put decals on windows. And then rodenticides is a really big one that impacts um, the food web, specifically raptors. So if a rodent eats the rodenticides, that rodent or that raptor is going to go after that slow moving sick rodent, ingest it, and unfortunately, a lot of the times they don't survive. And then it affects the whole food web from there. So there's other alternative methods for controlling rodents that aren't um, toxic for the environment. And then, of course, pets. You cannot have um, raptors or owls as pets. They are protected by the Migratory Bird Act. And last, I know Scott touched on this, um, viewing wildlife respectfully. It's important to view respectfully and quietly. It's also best to view the animal in the natural environment exhibiting natural behaviors, avoiding altering natural behaviors, so foraging, roosting, or even feeding their young. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, but you guys can find all of that on the California Department of Fish and Wildlife website, the Audubon Society's website, and then Cornell Lab of Ornithology is another really good source. So there's my speech, but I get to do the great honor of introducing Denver to you. Um, Denver holds a really special place in my heart, as you guys heard um, when I went to Montana with him. He made me hike eight miles in a foot of snow. It was hard work. But it's a great pleasure to introduce him. Denver uh, is a wildlife researcher and graduate from the University of Montana. He is the founder and president of the Owl Research Institute, a nonprofit organization located in Charlotte, Montana. As a dedicated field researcher, Holt believes that long-term field studies are primary means to understanding trends in wildlife populations. Denver has been a leader in owl research, education, and conservation for over 30 years. While much of today's research is conducted remotely or builds an existing data, Holt has been unwavering in his commitment to boots on the ground data collection, <laughs> a classic hardcore field researcher, and has spent a lifetime in the field with owls, observing, recording, measuring, and enjoying the natural world. The resulting body of work and its implications to conservation is an incredible gift and legacy. He is responsible for some of the longest running owl studies. So with all, uh, 
I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Denver. I'd like to introduce you guys to Denver. Help me give them a good, warm welcome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Melissa, do you want this? Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, I always forget what I'm going to say when I get here. So, first thing, though, is to thank Melissa and for her efforts to coordinate all this in such short notice, you know, to bring me in and, you know, our Raptor surveys that she helped develop 10 years ago. We just did one the other day and our transects, we had 670 Raptors on the five transects over 25 miles. So it's one of the hottest areas for wintering birds of prey in the Northwestern US, um, thanks to her and others. Uh, and then seeing Sage Audubon and all the Audubons, from what I understand, there was, um, Quite a few of you came together to help get me here and all that stuff. So, so I appreciate that. And then what I'm going to do is just kind of take you through the world of the snowy owl that I've experienced now over, I just finished my 31st year going for my 32nd year up in what was formerly called Barrow, Alaska, which is now called Uptiagvik, which is a Nupit Eskimo term, means a place to hunt snowy owls. So we'll talk about that and, um, and then just take you through the breeding season. It's really hard to do a public talk in, in many ways and a technical talk. So what I've been able to do over the years is uh, a little bit of data and a lot of nice pictures, a little bit of data and a lot of nice pictures. And I hopefully that satisfies everybody. And so um, with that, I'm just gonna get started. That's a female snowy owl on a nest, kind of cool looking bird there. And uh, let's see if I get this going. All right, so I, as I said, um, I'm going into my 32nd year coming up this year. Let's see what happens. Okay, so when I did this here, you know, this is just some very quick highlights, you know, 31 years of study, 30 years of studying the lemmings with the owls. Uh, our study area is 100 square miles, so most that's a lot bigger than the little eight miles I made you walk. And we've worked on 285 nests, banded 815 snowy owls, recorded almost 44,000 prey from pellets, 3,300 from cash nests, the first owl in the world with sa satellite transmitter. We've had the first six and the only live cameras uh, in the world on nesting snowy owls. And then I always say the snowy owls are the avian uh, icon of the Arctic as polar bears are for ice, uh, snowy owls are for the tundra and Arctic conservation. Um, in the end here, I'll, I'll talk about the live cams. We have a few clips to show you. So, so with that, I'll try to, be back and forth for both of you guys here. So this is uh this is up the Arctic, well, this is Barrow, Alaska, right here, as you guys can see, and that's the most northerly town in the United States. It's a Nupit Eskimo village, uh, a growing Nupit Eskimo village right on the Arctic Ocean. Okay, this is our study area here, and just you know briefly, it's a uh, hundred square miles uh, or two hundred fourteen square kilometers there. It's kind of a big area. Uh, I bit off more than I could chew when we started 30 years ago and I was younger. So oh, we'll walk over here, we'll walk over there. And now it's, I send the younger kids to do the really deep walks, you know, and all that. Uh, this is what it looks like. So this is Barrow, or the Ogdick. And this is July. So the ice has just come off. Usually, the ice is usually shore fast. Right up the end of June, early July last year, the ice was shore fast and you couldn't get out uh, up until mid July. Every morning I'd wake up before I'd head out there. This is June when I start up there, sometimes late May. But this year I was up there in early June. Every morning I'd get up, check the wind chill, check everything. And it was usually 23, 25, 27, 29. Might get up to 35 during the day. Wind always blowing, humid, absolutely miserable uh, all the time. But what I want you to see here too is this is where snowy owls, this is the object. This is where a place to hunt snowy owls used to be. And as Barrow has grown in modern day, they've actually, you wouldn't think that the, you could infringe on the tundra and push snowy owls out, but uh, that is occurring and more and more all the time. Okay, there's a long history of snowy owls in the Inupia culture. Most of the time, the Inupia Eskimo up there, they carve and admire subsistence animals. So whether it's walruses or seals or whales, caribou, things like that. 
and very few animals do they admire uh, that aren't subsistence animals. The snowy owl was hunted. Uh, again, a place to hunt snowy owls was taken. The eggs were taken. The chicks were taken as pets and all that, but it was kind of a summer supplemental food source. Also uh, pets, the kids had them and had fun with them and all that. So they admire the snowy owls for other reasons other than subsistence. And this here is, uh, that's a walrus ivory uh, carving there. And then if you look here, the bill and the eyes are baleen from a, a bowhead whale. And then the yellow or the goldish eyes there are fossilized uh, walrus ivory. And so they admire these things. They're really, really nice carvings. I've got a couple of them. All right, so anyway, when snowy owls come back to the tundra, this is what they see for the most part. You know, they see a snow covered tundra with, and remember these mounds, these tall mounds that are out there that melt off a lot a lot faster than the rest of the tundra. And mostly that's just because, you know, it's a tall mound, it's windswept, the sun beats down on it. And so when they come back, this is what they're looking for for nest sites. But how do they evaluate the lemmings in a landscape like this? And no one knows the answer to that yet. Okay, so as the tundra melts, you know, when we get there, it's melting off and it melts fairly fast, 24 hours of light from about May 2nd to, or May 10th to August 2nd or so. It melts very fast. And what we do is we go out there and we scan for snowy owls. We look along the ridges or the hills and boom, there's one right there. You guys on this side, and if you want to see it over here, somewhere over there. Yeah, there it is on that side right there. So what we do is we scan for vertical position snowy owls, all right? And we're looking for adult males, which we'll get into later, which tend to be almost pure white. So once we found a vertical position male snowy owl on a ridge or a mound, then we go left and right. And over the years, we've kind of casually said, 500 meters either side, or 500 yards if you want, either side of that, if there's gonna be a nest, then we're gonna find a vertical position, female snowy owl sitting on a nest. That's what we hope for anyway. Okay, tundra melts off. It makes finding these males a little, more e little easier. And as you can see here, they just glow. And you can see them across the tundra with the naked eye for, for quite a ways with binoculars, it's a little easier. And so that's what we're looking for. And we might get lucky, we might see some behaviors like this. And females are kind of like, give me my lemmy, you know? And this is what happens all the time is uh, males hunt, females take the food, et cetera. So we might get lucky and see that as an indication that there might be a nest around. And this is ultimately what we're looking for. There's a female on a nest, and this is a nice shot of her sitting there with a the lemmy in her mouth. She's very happy to have lemmies, trust me on that. And so that's what we're looking for. Now, from her perspective, however, only females incubate, only females brood the chicks, and males provide the food and the protection. We'll go through that. There's a division of labor there that I like, actually. Males have their job, females have their job. A little overlap, raise a family, depart afterwards and move on, all right? So it's, it's kind of a cool system, but part of her nest defense behavior is to be very, very vigilant on the nest. We wonder if they even sleep, you know? And sometimes they'll close their eyes and they wake up. They close their eyes and they wake up. Sleep might be very different to them than what we perceive it as. And so just look here, this is kind of neat. So she has a really commanding view of the surrounding tundra. All right, a really nice, she can see everything. And if she's not sleeping much, she's always looking, always alert for predators and researchers, okay? So this is what it looks like. This is the first sign of nest defense. Sorry guys, if I always shift right, because I always shift right. So I'll go over here, but so what the female does is she's sitting on the nest here, she's vigilant. She sees, you know, the, the, what we call ourselves, the, you know, the apes walking across the tundra here and she's out there and she sees these potential threats. If the threat moves sideways, she'll just sit there and watch and monitor and watch and monitor. But when the, the threat comes straight on, she'll leave the nest. So this is the first sign of nest defense. This is kind of cool here. All right, let's see if I can get it. All right, so that's it, first sign. She gets up, she flushes off the nest. So we're out there, especially when we were young and we were rookies, and we're out there, we're looking, we're, God, I swear there was a nest out there, you know? And we walk out and we see a male, we see a female, we can't find a nest and all that. Well, she's left the nest when she sees us in the distance. This is just one data point, but I just want you to see this here. Very short, it's, so she's leaving the nest at around 450 yards or 400 meters or so. No other owl in the world flushes from its nest at that distance. They always remain 
you know, concealed, hiding, let the threat pass within a few feet, or if it gets right on top of you, then they flush. These guys are leaving at great distances. But if you think about where they nest, they nest in the ground. There's no vegetation to cover them. They know they're white, and they see the threats, and they slip off the nest as the first sign of nest defense. Then, because we are who we are and we figured this out, we know that, okay, we can see the molted feathers on the nest mound there. Let's go to that nest mound. We march to the nest mound. Then things change a little bit. So from that passive, you know, moving off the nest to watch the potential threat, the female might come in and give you a threat display like this, looking at you. Or the male might fly in and they usually are in the air. They'll come above you and they'll bark at you. Oh, oh. Ooh. Ooh. So the nest defense is beginning because they're trying to protect their chicks. All right, female might come in and scream. I can't do a girl scream. Ah, you know, something like that. So, or some long whistle scream type thing. All right, so I can't do that. But anyway, they'll come in and they'll scream at you like this here. Or they may do a distraction display. And this is really unusual. Males usually don't do this. This is a male. He's coming in. He's like, oh, I got a broken wing. Follow me, follow me. So I'm an Arctic fox. Like, ah, oh, he's injured. Maybe I can grab him, yeah? So he'll lead you that astray that way or he'll come in more likely, he'll do a threat display at you, okay? And then the ultimate of what we call nest defense is the attack. And they come in and then they whack you, all right? So now they're, they're done with the passive part of it. You know, you're at the nest, you're a threat to the chicks. We don't see as much of the eggs, but once the eggs hatch, then you see this. And so this is a male, look at the concentration here. This is the male coming in on us. I'm gonna tell you right now, the legs are a lot longer than you think, all right? When we first went out there, I'm like, oh, I'll just duck, and I duck, boom, right in the side of the head, yeah. Very, very long legs, all right? And so this is what it looks like. This, this woman was walking her dogs down a gravel road outside of Barrow. This male came 500 yards across the tundra. She had two big labs, 50, 60 pound labs, and She's, the male came in and hit one of them in the lab, took off and went under her truck. She said the other male, Joe, turned around to take the owl on. The owl came in and hit it. Joe ran under the truck. They hate canids, all right? So imagine what they do to a little five-pound Arctic fox, you know? So that's it. And this is what it looks like if you're a researcher, okay? So, so this is it here. So that's me here. There's a nest. There's a chick right there, all right? That's the male. He was tough. And this poor guy, he's a plant ecologist, right? From Panama, oh, Costa Rica. He wanted to come out, oh, come and take me out. <laughs> so I took him out and the owl ripped his brand new Patagonia coat, like 300 bucks. <laughs> he was bummed about that, but he's still my friend. <laughs> okay. All right, now this is just a frequency histogram. So, but this is kind of cool too, all right? So there's some issues with this statistically, but for the most part, it's not what we're looking at. We're looking at this. So what it comes down to, males and females, all right? So they both bark. Ah, 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 ah. hoot, females really do. Females scream, males really do. Both attack, but dominated by males. And this is a little inflated because of one female. Uh, and then females display and males really do. So you see, there's a division of labor in breeding. There's a division of labor in nest defense. And a lot of things, there's a division of labor and a little bit of overlap. They come together to raise a family. So take those things I just said, all right? and we put them together, and what we're looking at, we think, and we have some data to indicate, we have more data to it now, we think that the more aggressive males and females who engage in attacks and screams and wing fainting will produce and fledge more young than the less aggressive, because we do have bum males. You know, you go to a nest and they like go hang out, and they're like, they don't do anything, and the females screaming and trying to protect, and they just stand over there, so we call them bum males, and we, we do have them. Uh, and we, I will say, we don't really have bum females. You know, they're, once they lay, they're pretty tight there. So anyway, so we're looking at that and that's what we think. We have more data to add to it. All right, so anyhow, this is it. Now, just imagine trying to see a snowy owl out here on a nest as the tundra melts. Well, the females dig the hole in the tundra. So they'll dig it with their talons and then they'll use their bill and they'll scrape out a hole. And the ground's pretty frozen, you know? And, but they'll do that then she'll lay the eggs and then she'll sit on the eggs. Okay, this is a female coming in. Look at her brood patch. Right? We all know what a brood patch is. So there's hormonal changes during the breeding season, increases in estrogen, prolactin, and other hormones. And it stimulates the feathers to fall out of the belly 
the lower belly region, the upper chest region, and the feathers fall out. Then there's an increase in blood flow. So you get this highly vascularized, you know, skin patch right here where she can apply direct heat to the eggs, roughly 100 degrees or so. And that's what she does. That's what she uh, incubates. So she incubates the eggs for, you know, 33 days or so. Only the female incubates, only the female develops a brood patch. And some other bird species, both males and females, you know, they can switch off and there's all kinds of things that go on. But in the owls, it's only the female. It's a huge, enormous brood patch because she's got to cover up to 10 eggs sometimes. All right, so we do things like measure the eggs and then we look at hatching and stuff like that. You know, many bird species hatch on the blunt end of the egg, which is up here. They get an air cell there. We found that snowy owls hatch out of the side of the egg. I don't know what that means or when they start breathing air uh, after, before hatching. But anyway, they hunt, they hatch out of that, um, usually in the order which they lay, they're laid. So they have asynchronous hatching. So, you know, we have synchronous and asynchronous, right? So like ducks, for example, pheasants, whatever. They lay all their eggs, they start incubation when the clutch is done. Snowy owls and other owl species start with the first egg. So you have asynchronous hatching. So they hatch in the order in which they're laid. So if we have 10 eggs, the first chick can be 10, 11, 12 days old, and the youngest chick can be one or two days old. So you have that. And then of course you have asynchronous growth. So we do all the measurements. We do the, you know, just a lot of stuff, you know, the biologist types do. And when they hatch out, they're like a little downy, pure white hair. Their eyes are sealed shut. They're totally dependent on the female for protection, for warmth, thermal regulation, because they can't thermal regulate, and for food. And so they grow rather quickly. And you can see here, here's the egg tooth right here where they break out of the eggshell. They go. And when we do our nest checks every three days, we can pick the eggs up if there's no fraction. We listen here. And you hear them just pounding on the inside like that. Uh, to try to break out of the eggshell. And their eyes are sealed shut for quite a while there, egg tooth is there. And again, totally dependent on the female uh, and the male. So as I said, they grow rather quickly here. And we can see, here's this great big powerful owl, this female. I mean, and they're just so much bigger than the males, so much more powerful than the males. And just to watch them from a blind and see how gentle they are with their chicks. And you know, we all talk about, or we hear about the Cain and Abel thing where the bigger sib beats up in the little sib. And herons and egrets, the bigger sim might throw the other one out of the nest. And golden eagles, they might, you know, the bigger one might kill the smaller one and throw it out of the nest. The owls are way smarter than that, you know? And so they're really nice to each other in the nest. And the female portions prey rather equally to all of the young. Where it gets a little tricky later on is just when they grow, the bigger chicks can maybe outcompete the others at getting to the food first, but they don't beat up on each other and things like that. So anyway, so we continue to monitor their growth. They've changed now from that little white that I showed you that what we call the prototile or the first down into what we call the mesotile or the second down. This is like the camouflage or the thermal down. And if you got, you take your gloves off and you go out there and you pick a chick up like that, it's so warm, you wanna have gloves made out of little chick bodies. You know, I mean, it's so, so nice and warm, but really, really rapid growth because they nest on the ground. So we continue to monitor them, chase them around and all that stuff, doing our research and it is, there's a degree of ha harassment, you know, wildlife research, but, you know, we justify it because we have licenses and all that stuff, and we hope we do good in the end. So, all right, so anyway, this is kind of neat, too. So they leave the nest, all right, at about three weeks of age, and not much is going on, you know, they can barely lift their heads the first week or so, and then they just start growing faster and faster and faster. And then just right here, this is all I want you to see, just right here, usually between the second and the third week, they're just piling it on, piling on the weight, growing as fast as they can, but mostly it's just all body mass. Their heads are developing and their legs are developing. That's what's going on right about now. So there's, it's not a huge sample. It's only two years of data, but it's about 225, but it's pretty good. And it shows, you know, they grow at about the same rate and all that. And then they leave the nest on foot at about three weeks of age. All right, so they're not gonna fly for another four weeks or so. All right, so we'll get to that, all right? And when they're out on the tundra now, they've got to put up with potential Arctic foxes. And as, as I showed you with that black lab, you know, the Arctic foxes, you know, they're sneaky and they're good hunters and all that stuff, but they get in the snowy owl territory and they just get whacked, whacked. And you can hear them. I've watched it and heard it. Arr! The owl hits it. Arr! Arr! And they chase them off the territory. 
Uh, but sometimes the Arctic foxes are tough too, you know, and they can, there's been some battles that I've seen over in Russia and Wrangell Island between Arctic foxes and snowy owls. All right, then you got polar bears, you know, they're not like a super threat or anything like that. They're not as far inland, but they do occur along the coast. And we had one instance where we were doing a film with somebody, we do a ton of those. And I don't know who it was, geographic discovery, somebody. Anyhow, a sow polar bear came, came walking down the canal or the, 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 the channel there and it was near the owl nest. And, uh, and so she came, she had two cubs with her and they got it on film, it was actually kind of cool. And the male snowy owl comes in and he lands between the nest and the bears. The female lands on the other side of the bears and they just, you know, they bark at them and fly around. But the bears, they were just trying to get to the coast. So it wasn't a big deal, but we have seen them attack bull caribou or caribou. The caribou don't know they're walking across the tundra, you know. They just have to be walking in the right direction, you know, and the owls come in and whack them, you know, and then they whack them. And I've seen the bull caribou, you know, like, what's going on? And, you know, like this with their, what's going on? But once they redirect them from the path to the nest, then, you know, caribou goes this way, the owls go right back to what they were doing. They're super, super forgiving. All right, but everything, everything hates snowy owls up there because the snowy owls eat their children, you know. And so these are the, this is the parasitic yang right thing, chasing, coming into snow. Every time a snowy owl moves up there, either a palmer and yang or a parasitic yang comes in and chases every single time that the owls move, they get harassed. And this is how they defend themselves. Every once in a while, they'll hook one of those yangers, but not that often. So anyway, as I told you here, at about three weeks of age, they're gonna leave the nest. So we try to get them all marked. We know because we visit the nest every three days, we know every individual in that nest. And when it's time to ban them, their legs are big enough. You know, we've got it all recorded. Everybody gets their individual ban prior to leaving the nest. And going back to what I said there, leaving the nest. Why leave the nest when you're only three weeks old and you're not gonna fly for another four weeks or so? Well, the, 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 the biggest answer is they nest on the ground. Even though they're big and they're powerful, and they're able to defend themselves fairly well, they're still susceptible in certain areas. There might be wolves or wolverines or coyotes, occasional Arctic fox, occasional polar bear, occasional grizzly bear, something like that, that might get to the nest. And so again, they leave in the order in which they hatch. And so the first two or three might leave at three weeks, but the other guy's still only two, two weeks old. But if a predator comes in and finds a nest and eats them all or kills them all, you still have a couple that have already left. All right, so you still have a chance for reproduction this season. So anyway, that's what we think is going on. And what we did, you know, are they stressed out? And so blah, 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 we take them, we take blood, we look at their hormone levels, you know, their stress levels. And so long story here, but to, to make a long story short, when they leave the nest at three weeks of age and we look at their stress levels, their corticosterone levels, so you got, you know, a stressful stimulus might be no food. It might be a big sib beating up on a little sib. Whatever it is, it, there's a stressful stimulus and it can show up in the blood. So we bleed them within three minutes and we bleed them over time. Then I, we do the assays and all this stuff. It's a, what they call the HPA access, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal. What we find, and I work with the endocrinologists on this, is that whether you're on the nest or off the nest, your basal level is about the same. Even though it, it rises over time and there's, some, there's a developmental process involved here, the bottom line is when they leave the nest, they're not stressed out, all right? And again, that kind of goes back to the argument that it's probably because they nest on the ground and it's susceptible to predation. The shorter owl leaves its nest at, you know, about two weeks, just a little more than two weeks of age. And why the difference between the two? Well, the snowy owl is big and powerful and can protect itself. Plus it's a big bird, so it probably has a longer developmental process. The shorter owl, a shorter developmental process, and it's not really that aggressive at the nest. So. Anyhow, so they're kind of cool when they leave the nest. Everything's fine. I feel good. I can thermal regulate. I got on my thermal down uh, jacket here. I should be able to take care of most of the weather, but I still need food. So we follow them around. You know, if they get sick, we try to figure out what's going on. We do not try to save them, and it kills you because I've not been out there 31 years. I like them. And it just kills you to see when one's dying. Uh, but it's not my job to save them. My job is to figure out why some live and some die. And so it's really hard to do, except for one, one owl, which we called Terminator, who turned out to be Terminatorist is another story. All right, so, so some die and we try to figure out why. And so we take them into the labs and stuff like that. 
Um, what, we, what we've learned over the years is you kill, if the parents get shot, then the chicks starve to death, okay? But also too, with increasing rain, and when we have three or four heavy days of rain, we think that the lemon activity is suppressed and it's harder to find food and the birds will just starve to death. And so when we do the growth necropsies, we look at there's no fat, particularly around the heart, all the fat's been absorbed around the heart and they become susceptible to pneumonia and hypothermia and things like that. And they up and die. And then we take specific parts and we send them down to the histopath to try to figure out any other things. But some live, all right? And so, and it's, there's a lot of mortality up there in the Arctic in these guys here. A lot of just natural mortality, but some live and they're starting to grow and really look pretty cool, wandering the tundra. Who knows where they're going? Do they know where they're going? Uh, not sure we know the answer to that yet. So we continue to look at them, continue to monitor them. And then at about this age here, we started seeing a few things which are kind of cool, which might relate to your bird here, is we started seeing that some of the birds were like a sooty gray and some of them were like a silver gray. Some of them had a few more markings on the wing feathers and some of them didn't. And we're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, we, we started recording it. We came up with this system. And so we looked at, at these here, all the heavy markings and these here, siblings, okay? All right, brothers and sisters here. And we predicted this is a female, this is a male. And then what we did is we took blood we sent the blood into the lab. We didn't tell the lab our predictions, all right? And then we looked at these feathers and we found these patterns on the feathers. And if you look here, this is what we call transverse bars. So you have bars that go right across the entire feather. Here's the feather shaft in the middle of the rachis. Then you have irregular bars and they go across, but they, they're not like continuous. They're broken, but they still come in and touch the rachis or the feather shaft. And then you have what we call spots of these little things that don't touch the feather shaft. So we sent them all in, 140 chicks we sent in. We had our predictions, but we hid our predictions from the geneticists. We didn't want to influence their, you know, their analysis or anything. And we got all 140 correct as far as sex goes. And the dark one was a female, the light one was a male. And so this is another composite here. Anyway, this is what it looks like. Female wing, male wing. When we look at it, we built these models. If you look at one feather, secondary number four, if you can tell with you know, almost 100% accuracy using that, if it's a male or a female, all right? So, and that's kind of relates to your bird here, which we'll talk about in the end. So anyway, they continue to grow. I mean, that's a good looking bird as there is anywhere in the world at this stage. Yeah, it's a beautiful, a very handsome bird. So we continue to monitor them. Other things we do is we measure nests. You're like, well, what's, I mean, how could there be habitat loss up there in the, in the Arctic tundra? Well, there is habitat loss. And as Barrow grows, and what's been going on is they tend to build the roads and housing projects and stuff on the high center of the drier sites wherever they can. And these are the sites where the snowy owls are. But it's kind of neat. And just very quickly, any of you who've lived in northern cities, you know what happens with the snow and the rain and freezing and thaw, and you get cracks cracks in the road and then the water goes down in there, then it freezes and it heaves up the sides. This is how the snowy owl mounds that they nest on are uh, evolved. And they can be, they're 10,000 years old. There's old trees and that's what the snowy owls nest on. Then what we do, actually this is kind of funny here. So my, my Inupian friends, they think that we're crazy. You know, they think, you know, they just say, oh, you white guys are always counting things and uh, just use your head. And I go, and they go, why? They say, Denver, why are you measuring the mound that the owl uses and comparing it with other mounds? So we're doing random versus used, right? Because that's how we're trained. And they say, think about it. Everyone knows they nest on the tallest mounds that melt off first in the summertime or in the spring. And so we do all the analysis, we do all the data and all that. And we say, yeah, they nest on the tallest mounds that melt off in the spring. <laughs> and it's like doing the pellet analysis and so many other things. And the Inupians think that we're just dumb. And so, so anyway, I got to make fun of what we do sometimes. All right, so uh, we capture them sometimes. You know, I, we need a bigger crew up there to capture more of them. This is the first snowy owl in the world with a transmitter on, a satellite transmitter. This female here, we had the first six in the world. The day is much better now. The transmitters are much better. There's a lot of people, Project Snowstorm's got some good stuff going. People in Canada and Russia and Scandinavia, they all got some pretty good stuff going. But that's what generated uh, all of this, this um, snowy owl satellite tracking was our studies here and the first ones to put them on in 1990 and stuff. 
uh, 99, 2000. This just shows you here what it rides like here. Okay, and this was just the first analysis. Now, again, what this did is it stimulated other people to go out and catch snow owls and put satellite transmitters because you would say, hey, look, they never left the Arctic. They stayed in the Arctic all winter long. These were all females. They stayed in the Arctic all winter long. And they went from Barrow, Alaska to Russia, down here, back over here, all over here, over the course of a couple of years. What are they doing? What are they eating? And all that. If you read the historical literature, literature which none of the young kids do, you do find that early explorers saw snowy owls along coasts in the Arctic in the wintertime. Coast Guard cutters that were able to break ice saw them out in Polynias and on the edge of the pack ice. So they've always been known to do this. And now we're learning more and more as we have better, better technology and all that stuff. So even though we learned we only had a few, it kind of generated this whole new interest in what they're doing in the wintertime. Okay, so this is a male. All right, and this is what it looks like. They're pretty good size. And males do most of the hunting, as I said. All right, so females sit on the nest, females incubate brood, males hunt. All right, is the weaponry they use right here. You know, birds have two to four toes. Most birds have four toes. That's my hand, so a decent sized male hand. And that gives you an idea of the weaponry. You know, imagine if you're a little one ounce lemony. Yeah, it's gotta hurt. And so anyway, they use that. They eat a wide variety of things. This is a male coming in, very typical, flying into the female to deliver food. Okay, in our area, they eat two species of weasels. This here for you shorebird people is kind of cool. Of all the birds up there that they eat, which isn't a heck of a lot, they seem to like the red fowler rope the most. This is an adult female red fowler rope being swallowed down by a two week old snow owl. Okay. okay, they do eat eider ducks, which you know kind of aggravates the US Fish and Wildlife Service because the eiders are threatened species, but that's life. And this was a remarkable photo. Uh, this is a spectacled eider. For those of you who are bird watchers, this is a huge duck. This is a male spectacled eider. Dan Cox, my buddy, was in the blind. Female got all excited. She, she perked up and he was watching her. She had been over the hill and he couldn't see, but he could see wings going and uh, like, a, like you know, a fight going on. And about five or 10 minutes later, she flew back with this. Barely could fly. Happy chip though. Okay, this happened, all right? So in times of food shortages is when we see most of our nestling mortality. So chicks die, all right? Probably starve to death most of the time. And the female makes decisions. And I don't know how she makes her decisions, of course, but she makes decisions. There's a food source right here and my dead chick. Do I feed it to another chick? Do I eat it myself or do I leave it? And we see all of those behaviors. In this case here, you know, it was, a, it was a tough year. And so that chick had starved to death, was laying there dead and she fed it to another chick. So some people think, oh God, how could that happen? But I look at it like that's mothering, you know? I mean, she's trying the best she can to raise some young. And if it means, you know, feeding a dead, a, a dead offspring to, to another one, then that's what it is. And sometimes they'll eat them and other times they just lay there. So who knows how the decisions are made. Okay, so in our area, in Vera, Alaska, there's two species of lemming. We call the lemming. This is the one that turns white. Kilimiatark is the Inupiat word for it. It turns white in the wintertime. It's kind of got a magical quality to it as far as Eskimo lore and culture goes. And then the brown lemming, lemmis, and this is what makes the world go round uh, up there in the Arctic where I work. Uh, and it doesn't turn uh, white at all. It stays under the snow most of the winter, we think. All right, so all eats lemming, cast pellet, Pellet equals data. Data is skulls. And so we count skulls in order to find out the food habits. Another thing the Inupiats look at us and say, are you out of your mind? Everyone knows they eat lemmings, you know? And so what we do is we say, yeah. And this is one of those graphs, right, that everyone hates to look at. And I just put it in here because I have to make fun of us sometimes. I just sit at a professional meeting and you put this graph up. No one can see it. No one can read it. No one can understand it. Why we do it. I, and I just say, let's just summarize these things. Forget putting these tables and things like that. So anyway, look at this here. This is pretty impressive. So 43,689 prey recorded from pellets, largest sample in the world, undoubtedly. And 95% and of it's brown lemmings. Okay, that's looking at pellet analysis. It shows you how tied in they are to lemmings in my area. Then, oh, we do this diversity. Don't worry about this. All it means is they're kind of tied into 
one species for the most part, okay? All right, and this is what it looks like at a nest, all right? So you go to a nest every three days and you see a pile of dead lemmings, hopefully. And you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. And so we started recording that, you know? And this is another one of those. And this is what it looks like in real life. And so when we look at 3,334 prey found cache at the nest, our species diversity goes up quite a bit, you know, so you get things like, you know, passerines and gulls and shorebirds and ducks and all that. But brown lemmings is still 88% of the diet, you know. So it's still all about brown lemmings. And then we do the diversity indices at the nest. So it increases a little bit, but they still primarily eat one and a half to two species. So this is in a good lemming year. There's 55 lemmings piled up at the nest right here. Our high count was 86, all right? And so, I mean, we love it because it's free data, all right? We don't have to do anything for this data, but pick it up, male, female, unknown, weigh it, brown lemming, crawl lemming, whatever, and record it. So it's free data for us. And it's really kind of neat stuff. And that's what it looks like. So you can see if the females are pregnant or lactating and all that, males are scrotal. And most every female's pregnant, most every male is scrotal. And they're, everybody's breeding, you know? And so, so there's the free data. Okay, but this is cool, all right? Oh, that, too bad that bar's in the way. This is good information, you guys. Look at this here. So, so if we look at the mean of all of these ones, so the sample size is, you know, 2,500. So the, the mean of these is 71 grams, okay? So this is a sample size for males and females. Just remember that. The grand mean over the years for lemmings cached at the nest is 71 grams, all right? So we also have our sampling. We kill lemmings. I, you know, I, I, it, it's, I feel bad about it, you know, but it's, we've been doing it for so long. I can't change it. All right, so anyway, we sample them. And right? we count nests, and then we run transects, and we observe them as well. Okay, now I want you to look at this trapping result. Look at the mean here, 48 grams, okay? So when we look at the mean over 18 breeding seasons, we have 48 grams for the ones that are in our sampling line and 71 grams for the ones that the males are bringing to the nest. Then, oh, let's see, did, did, that move, did that move? Yeah, oh, that's, that's what I want. No, did I screw up here? Snap, trap, snap, okay, yeah. So. When you look at that, and then you look at, we have the 18 breeding seasons and 12 non-breeding seasons, 48 and 53, pretty tight, no difference between them. And the sex ratio is about the same. So anyway, what we conclude, what's going on here is that males are bringing their wives the best food and the biggest food. You know, I mean, that's, so you got to give the males a lot of credit here. You know, whether they're eating them or passing them up, we don't know but the biggest ones are coming home because you got a lot of mouths to feed. So, so, and that's what, when I say that the females, they don't mess around with young males. They, they, only older males is what they want because they're the guys that got the resources. Okay, so how are lemmings doing? This is just a little, a little graph here. You know, we all heard about lemmings. Uh, and some people, it's funny, you know, some people don't know what a lemming is and I understand that. Uh, when I worked at Mass Audubon, Massachusetts Audubon years ago, you know, you take in phone calls, people call in, they say, oh, there's a snowy owl at Plum Island. And why is it there? And the woman was telling me who fielded the call. And, and the woman who called up said, oh yeah, I saw the snowy owl was really neat. And the, the, the woman who, the information officer said, oh, when the lemming populations crash in the north, the snowy owls move south in search of food. And the woman paused on the phone and she said, I didn't know citrus grew that far north. Lemming, lemming, you know. So anyway, I thought that was great. So anyhow, so this is this, you know, it's a pretty good relationship. The nesting owls and the lemmings. You, the lemmings are high, owls are high, the lemmings are low, but both are kind of decreasing. Snowy at a faster pace, uh, pace than the lemmings. So this year we had a pretty good lemming year, but not a good owl year. So it kind of puzzled me. So this line is coming up and flattening out, but this one is still going down. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but I thought you would see it. And these are other trap lines. It's a really pretty good relationship uh, between the number of lemmings and the number of owl nests. All right. So here's, here's the study area again. So what we've done now is we've looked at this 100 square mile study area. And we look, these are, I can't remember, 279 nests or something like that in here. And these are all nests. And so we got, we got, we got a GIS guy and, and 
a little mini brain guy and brought them together here. And what they did is they looked at all our nests and they created these models. And what they found was actually kind of cool is that, all right, so the average nest, remember I told you earlier, we used to say 500 meters either side of the nest. So when they looked at that, they say, the average nest over 18 seasons is, is uh, you know, a thousand, you know, a thousand meters, 1600 meters to a mile or so. So we were kind of just guessing and we were right on. And then in your high years, uh, 54 nests, they're closer together, four nests are further apart. And when we look at it, let me see if I do this right. Okay. And when we look at it annually, the nests are randomly distributed. But now over 18 years, when we look at it, they're statistic statistically clumped. So the owls are returning to specific sites. And you see, here's a clumping, 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 here's a clumping. And you can see all the clumping over time. So if you were to do a short-term study, which unfortunately most wildlife research anymore is, you would conclude one thing. But if you do long-term research, which is rare, then you may come up with many different things. And the things you thought, you know, when you had two or three years or four years of data, don't turn out when you have 10 or 12 or 15 years of data. So, so this is what it looks like here. These are the nest mounds. This is where we find the owls in this type of habitat. It's also where we have the highest densities of lemmings. All right, so population estimates. Someone said that to me today, the snowy owl is rare, there's only 30,000 left. Well, I wanna just say open country species of owls, you know, having a tough time. How we come up with these numbers, I'm not sure yet. Uh, you know, and I have some questions on how we come up with these numbers. So they say we have 48% increase in barn owls as of 2019. I checked these the other day, they're still pretty close. And uh, there's not a barn owl researcher I know that thinks that they're increasing. And then you look at the snowy owls, 64% decline. Burrowing owl, 35, wandering owl, 91, shorted owl, 65. How do we come up with these numbers? No one questions that. So, so now when we look at snow owls, in 2004, we thought there were 290,000 snowy owls in the world. And in 2022, we think there's 15,000 pairs. Maybe. How do we come up with that stuff, All right? So one guy does extrapolations from known nesting areas. Another person uses mitochondrial DNA. And so when you look at the people who are the pros at this, they say you can't use mitochondrial DNA to do population estimates because of what you read up here. All right? So that leaves us with, do we really know or were we just guessing? I think we're just guessing. And so, and until we develop survey methods, we're not really gonna, we're not, you know, none of the surveys really can do this to owls. So we're not gonna know what the, the snowy owl is or any other owl species. All right, how do snowy owls do in relation to oil and gas exploration? They do fine. I hate to say that. And I know all my environmentalist friends are mad at that, but we look at it. This is a, this is a gas pipeline pumping station here. As long as you're not running over with them with ATVs and snowmobiles, they do pretty good because they're protected areas, maybe like where your female is hunting at night if she's going to, to the reserves. And so they do pretty good with this stuff here. And I think the lemmings do better because of all these structures, more snow is retained and the lemmings live under the snow as long as they possibly can and they're not as susceptible to predation. All right, this is, this is an issue. Ukiagvik, a place to hunt snowy owls. Well, as time has moved on, they, you know, the Inupias quit eating them. And we don't know who killed these owls, whether it was a new pitch, whether it was white people or anything else up there. But nonetheless, this is what we'd find. So I went on the radio show in Baralaska, right? And I said, if you want, if it tastes like chicken, you want a chicken, go buy a chicken. All right, there's no need to shoot these things, whoever you are, all right? There wasn't a white biologist in a thousand miles that stood by me on this, all right? So the Inupiates came to my rescue. They said, Ukpik man. So Ukpik is the Inupian name for snowy owl. They call me Ukpik man because I've been doing it so much. And they go, Ukpik man's right. He said, we don't eat Ukpik anymore. People come from all over the world to see Ukpik here. It's one of the, it's the only place in the United States that's reliable breeding site. So the Inupians passed a resolution to say no more killing snowy owls in the Barrow region, in the Ukpik region. And it's been pretty good. Native Village of Barrow did that. So pretty cool. This one was tough though. So this is over in, supposedly over in Russia, a few years back, they were trapping snowy owls in leg hole traps like this and taking their eyes and send them down to the aphrodisiac market in, in Asia. Supposedly, that's how the story went. Supposedly there was hundreds of them. We were, everyone's trying to find out the truth behind it and all that stuff. 
Uh, clearly they were being killed. We don't know how many uh, and all that, but I haven't heard about it in a long time. Uh, but anyhow, that, that was an issue. This here was probably the worst one for me personally. This was at Barrow. And this was when, as I told you earlier, the Stellar's eye is a threatened species. And so when Stellar's eye's population supposedly declined, which you know, no, there's no really great evidence of that, that uh, fish and wildlife decided that, well, let's kill iron foxes because foxes eat duck eggs and then we'll make more eiders. Well, that hasn't panned out, but this is what happened. They put fox traps on all the nesting mounds where the snowy owls were and they killed this. And until this got on the internet, somehow it did, they wouldn't listen to me, but somehow it got on the internet. And then, and then boom, it was resolved. Okay, and then this is kind of a neat thing. We just published a paper. You know, why are snowy owls white? All right, well, it makes sense, right? Polar bears, beluga whales, Arctic fox turning white in the wintertime, ptarmigan turning white in the wintertime, where you spend most of your time, you, you know, you kind of match your environment where you live. Okay, so that, that makes sense. And, but then why do males look like they do and females look like they do? And so anyway, and I, I'll, 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 I'll move along here really fast. And so what we found out over the years is that, and what we think is going on, is that females probably retained their brown bars if they, you know, are a distant relation to great horned eagles of Europe. Maybe they've just retained this and that's all there is to it. But why would a male be this bright white? Why glow like that? And so we're saying, huh, it's kind of interesting. So the first thing that comes to your mind is they, they nest in the Arctic tundra, 24 hours of light. All right. So when most owl species, it's the hooting and the tooting, you know, it's <laughs> the great horn that you hear, or the saw wet. Street owl. But with the snowy owl, vision is probably the most important social signaling. 24 hours of light, open tundra. So that's what we think is going on here. If you look at a couple of these, why be that bright white? Remember what I said, there are males until they get to be bright white, they kind of look like females. Those males never breed and never have territories. So we were wondering, wow, do snowy owls reflect in the UV range? All right, you know, why be that bright white? Maybe they reflect in the UV range like many species of birds, fish, insects, et cetera. So anyhow, you know, we looked at that and all this, we got some help from some uh, researchers from NASA who know how to do this stuff. And we looked at this one male, we found this beautiful male dead, he had six, seven eggs, he just was dead, I don't know why. He wasn't killed that we could tell by anything. Anyhow, so we looked at that and pretty much what, 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 what it is, is they reflect 80% as, as bright as white snow. You know how beautiful white snow is, you know, fresh snow. And so they reflect about like fresh snow uh, and there's certain areas of the body that reflect more and brighter than other areas of the body. When snowy owl males court females, they'll catch a lemming and they'll be on a mound or they'll fly to one. They'll have the lemming in their bill and they put their wings kind of out like this. And they, you know, turn around like that, presenting the brightest areas of their plumage of the female. Supposedly that's get her excited. Oh my man, you know, I'll mate with him. He's, he's got food, he's got a house and he's a good dancer. And so, so anyway, so we look at that and then we looked at, so we don't think that they reflect in the UV range. And then people who study visual acuity and visual mechanism and owls find out that they don't have the mechanisms to see in the UV range. So that's ruled out. And anyhow, what we think is going on is it's just sexual selection. You know, over time, because they're in the tundra, 24 hours of light, that the males evolve bright white and the females have this camouflage coloration. She looks at a male, if he's bright white, he's older, he's got resources. And, and our data supports that. Females only breed with older white males with resources. And that's that's what it is. Younger males who are spotted don't get to breathe. They hang out in bachelor groups. They might be bright white someday, but right now they don't have it. So anyway, and then here you look, the tundra's changing. You know, you get towards the end of August here. This is, it's changing over. Fall's coming. And so the females start to move away from the nest. They start to move away from their chicks. Maybe they're replenishing all their body reserves and stuff. And then what happens is this, you're a snowy owl, right? We have this thing called an eruption migration. It's really no definition to it, you know? It, I mean, we all say, oh, 50 snowy owls just showed up at the airport in Boston and 100 showed up in the Great Lakes region and one showed up in Cyprus, 
you know, California. It must be an eruption. Well, what's an eruption? But nonetheless, it happens. And so we're not going to go into this, but there's no real definition of eruption. It doesn't mean 50 birds, 100 birds, 20 birds. We have words like a mini eruption, a mega eruption, a whole ton of owls came down, you know, stuff like that. So there isn't any meaning. So I always look at the, the primary meaning in the dictionaries and their Latin origins and then what we use today. And a lot of times it doesn't match up. But nonetheless, this is what we see even in Montana. They say land on houses, all right? And they move into neighborhoods adjacent to areas where they hunt. So what are these? Is this a male and a female? Are these two females? Are they both hatchier birds? Is one a hatchier bird and one greater than a hatchier bird? I don't know, but they sure look like both females to me, okay? Whether they're, and I think that the one on the left, the dark one, yours is probably in between both of those, I think. And so they just show up, they hang out in these houses and even in Montana, they'll stay for a while. One day there's 20 there, the next day there's 15, next day there's 25, you know, I mean, it, it just varies quite a bit. And this is what it looks like. And so one thing that we forget is that they're programmed to migrate. So after the breeding season, like most, almost all Arctic birds, the snow comes, it's cold, there's no food, you move south. Snowy owls do the same thing for, for the most part here. And this is what we tend to see. And this is Montana with groups of these young owls. So your bird, from what I can tell looking at her, uh, and I'm calling her her, I think it is a female. Uh, it looks like she's probably, you know, right now she's probably maybe seven months old. She got here when she was maybe five months. I, November, is that when she showed up? November 12th. So she probably hatched in mid, mid to late June. All right. Did her thing as I've been showing you here. And then at some point, September is what we think, maybe early October, the female leaves, the male continues to drop food off, the male leaves, now you gotta, you're on your own. And what we see very often is that groups of these young birds will show up out to sea and they'll land on a ship or they'll land on a Loran tower or they'll be on a rock down along the coast somewhere. Whether they're related or not, we don't know, but they seem to move on the same front. Did your bird come in on a boat? I doubt it. Not that they wouldn't do it, but you would have heard by now, somebody on a boat, on a ship would have taken a photo. I mean, these guys, this always happens. You know, a few years ago, like seven or eight snowy owls boarded a boat, leaving Newfoundland, Canada, going all the way across. When they got to the coast of France and the owls could see, they all flew to France, you know? And so that does happen, but I don't think it's yours, or I think you would have known. She might've just come down the coast. She just might have overshot. You know, the typical area would be, let's just say, from Washington all the way across to, you know, the Great Lakes, New England, southern Canada. That's kind of their typical range. And they may drop down sometimes in a big year a little further into the Midwest. There's records in Texas, records in Florida, records in Bermuda, and all that. Your bird just might have just kept going. Maybe she's still around. I hope she still is. She probably is. Uh, but anyway, that's what I would think is going on with your bird here. And so... I want to leave you guys with just a couple parting shots here. Why I still go there. Why I'm still an ardent field researcher. And we have 10 major research projects. The long owl projects, probably even more data than this one. Short-eared, snowy, pygmy, boreal, sawet. I mean, we got short-eared, you know, 40 years of data. Uh, I got to get it written before I die though. So anyway. Uh, so, but I want to leave you some shots that I think are kind of cool. And then in the very last shot, it's, it's, it's live. And I'm just going to be quiet for the rest of these. And I just want you to look at it and then appreciate. This is from our camera this year up in Barrow, Alaska, and supported by a California Foundation. The only live snowy owl cameras ever in the world. There's only been four. We've done all four with this California Foundation. And I want you to see it. So these are some parting shots here before I take questions.
I want to thank everybody for coming and thank Seeing Sage, Bolsa Chica, Conservancy, and all that stuff. Uh, and you know, you can go check out you know our website. You can see all the projects. You can see the archives of these live cams, and uh, take the newsletter. Support all research. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Yes. That's a lot there. Okay, so if you want to ask a question, they want you to go to the mic, but I heard you and I'll repeat the question. So I think, so what, you know, what happened to your owl? Number one, there, is she still around where she might've gone? Uh, maybe she just exhausted the food nearby. And, you know, it sounds like she was eating uh, the Boda's pocket gopher, which is a really big pocket gopher. She's been seen with a coot. But maybe she just, you know, and I, I went to the neighborhood today to see, and I couldn't figure out why she might be there. Um, you know, I, I don't know the reason why she's there, but where is she now? I suspect she's fine. She's been here since November 12th. You know, so she, yeah. So she's eating, you know, she's eating well. She knows how to hunt. She's probably fine. Maybe she just shifted. When, when, when Melissa and I were driving today and along the coast and I saw those bluffs along there, along the marsh, I mean, that's where I'd be if I was a snowy owl, sitting in those bluffs, soaking up some sun, catching some wind because I'm probably overheating, and then looking at ducks and coots and shorebirds and anything else to kill. So. Okay, she's seven months old, and does she know how to get back to the Arctic? Yeah, she's programmed to go back. She may take the same route too, you never know. Uh, and can she do it? Well, she got here. And so she's capable of flying all the way back, I'm sure. They do that all the time. He's a little further south than normal, but they come down to the, to the States and then they go back. And then some of them come back year after year to the same areas. You know, there's good data to indicate that some of those birds come back. And matter of fact, maybe you won't see one. You catch one one year, 10, 15, 20 years later, you catch that same bird again. And that's the only other time you've ever seen it. So that does occur. I'm sure she's fine. I'd follow the coast. Maybe she came from Russia. Maybe she came across a bearing and just went straight down the coast like that. Maybe she was in Alaska somewhere. We only, we didn't have much nesting going on this year. Was she one of our birds? She wasn't banded already, look. Uh, so yeah, I, she's capable of doing it. She, I, she's probably going to be fine unless someone shoots her. Yeah. All right, you have to go to the mic, ma'am. Sorry, I was supposed to tell people that. Is it on? Yeah, try it. Correct. Okay, there's a lot there too. Um, I have to repeat the question for the Zoom people. How do they keep track of the chicks if they spread out? Once they leave the nest, whether it's five or 10, how do the adults keep track of them? And well, I can't remember the other part already. <laughs> and do they recognize them later on? Okay. So yeah, we wonder that, you know, is there some direction that they're moving? Sometimes we get a feeling that the adults do move them and not physically, maybe they lure them to areas because they, they kind of end up on ridges towards the end there. And when they get on these ridges, that's where the wind's blowing. And that's where they jump up and down. They practice and they're building the pectoralis and supercorticorious muscles, and they're doing that. So it seems like adults do lead them in a certain area. 
How they know where they all are, I don't know. But when we can't find them, there's a lot of times, let's say five chicks leave the nest. We go out, we find one. Next time we find three. Next time we find one. Next time we find five. But if you sit down there and you sit there all day long and you watch when it's feeding time, you'll see the male flying across the tundra. You don't see anything and he goes, boom, and the chick sticks its head up. They know where every one of them are. Where do they recognize them later after the female leaves? Because the females usually leave first, you're on your own. Males continue to, to raise the young, males do a lot. And, uh, and then the males leave. Do they recognize them years later? I, I don't know that at all. Um, but they, they do tend to you know, feed them right up until they fledge. And so anyway, so that's, that's the answer. Go ahead, yeah, come to the, yeah, so, sorry you have to do that, but that's the way it is. Yeah, um, okay, was she vulnerable being on the roof? Can I say that's the question versus being in a tree? Well, they've evolved on the tundra, number one. All right, so they're not gonna be hiding in a tree like a great horn or a long ear or something like that. So they, they prefer to be exposed, okay? That, that's, that's how they live. And when they migrate south, they're generally in areas where it, which is very exposed. And they tend to be in the, in the windiest, coldest, nastiest areas in the wintertime. So, She's probably fine. She's big enough to, to ward off probably any threat, you know, maybe an eagle, but, you know, an eagle probably is not going to take on a, 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 a snowy owl very often. Anyway, they're just both too big. Uh, if anything could do it, it might be an eagle. So she's not probably worried about anything, you know, maybe gets harassed by crows or, or something else, but she may be up there because it was the coolest site around, you know, and I don't know. I was wondering, is there a constant breeze there that's nowhere else or something like that? Because, you know, they, they'll overheat. You saw her, uh, uh, Melissa called me and she was ghoul of fluttering one day. You got a 70 degree day or something like that. And so she was vibrating the muscles up here, the hyoid apparatus and the hyoid muscles. And she was evaporating water in her upper throat to help herself cool down. It's kind of like panting in dogs, but it's a little, you know, cheats the system a little bit. So, uh, I, you know, she's pro it's probably not a big deal for her to be sitting out there exposed like that. Yeah, yeah, why not her? Yeah, she's programmed to do that, you know, and hopefully she finds a nice adult male that's got a territory and resources. <laughs> Thank you. Walk up there if you feel shy and do that. Just yell it out and I'll answer. Okay. All right. So, you know, what have I observed? How does it bring people together? What is it all about? Is kind of the question. I suppose it's, I have to say, it's great unless you're the person that lives in the house. All right. And we have seen some retaliation uh, uh, over the years. Um, I, maybe I said this, but I'm going to say it again. Of all the animals in the world, owls are one of the most widely recognized groups of animals. They occur in all continents except Antarctica. They're in native cultures as far back as we can go. There's etchings in the cave walls in France that date back 15 to 30,000 years of owls. Owls are just so widely recognized 
everywhere they go in the, one of the most popular groups of animals in the world. If this was a rare Asian bunting that showed up, the birders might come, but the public wouldn't come. And it's just something about not only owls, but the snowy owl, the white owl from the north, the great white owl, whatever it is, and whatever the fascination of the magic is, no other animal gets treated like a snowy owl. As you guys have seen here, thousands and thousands of people, look at the crowd here tonight and how many people are watching on Zoom. I mean, it's, it's pretty spectacular. And it's, you know, when, I, when I'm at these things, there's probably no greater wildlife viewing experience when that happens anywhere in the country. People don't just go see a sparrow or a, a lizard or, or even some, you know, cool mammal like a bear. But when the snowy owl shows up, everyone goes, and it's all walks of life. And, and it's just a neat social kind of gathering. People get to know each other. And it's, you know, it's almost like going to a sporting event. You drop everything as you root for your team. And every, you can drop whatever it is that might make you different and talk about the snowy owl and how cool it is. You know, it's, it, it, re it really is pretty, pretty fascinating. And when it occurs everywhere in the country, it's the same response. Everyone goes out, you know, even like senior centers, they rent buses and they roll out all the seniors and stuff, you know, and they ask me to come up and talk to them, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I, I hope that answers it. Next. All right, so I'm not so sure about the decline, number one. They, the question was for you Zoom people, um, you know, the data indicates that there might be a decline. And then if we were to see injured birds or sick birds, will we do anything to help them? Okay, uh, I'm not so sure about the data. You know, I, I don't think we know that totally yet. We really need to develop surveys, whether they're stable, increasing, decreasing, all that. But how do you go from 290,000 to 30,000? I don't know. Um, as far as injured birds, sick birds, I think that it's in, in our hearts. If it was hit by a car, someone shot one, it got tangled in a barbed wire fence, or was sick and starving, to go help it. I mean, that, that's okay. But to, to go out and it was suggested that this one be trapped and bring it in and fly it back to Alaska or something like that. You know, we, we don't do that. So I think if we cause some of the injuries, or if it's just, you know, you see it starving, you want to help it. I mean, that's okay. We don't do that in our research. But I think, I think that's just in our nature to do something like that. And I think that's fine. And then, then release the birds. You know, we had a female this year, a young female of that nest. We had six chicks in the nest. The first oldest, three oldest were males. The second three were females. And female number five, all of a sudden we get a phone call that there's an owl on the road in Barrow. And you know, it just didn't add up. And so anyway, the kids beat it with a stick and beat it up pretty good. So we took it in, we flew it to a rehab facility in Montana and she's rehabbing it, the bird's flying right now, we're gonna bring it back to the tundra. And that's because of that circumstance, you know? But if the chick was out on the tundra, we probably would just, you know, leave it alone and, and then let whatever happen. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the the question was again for Zoom people: If the bird did come down here naturally, how come no one saw it? Uh, how did it get here? And did it come down fast? I, I don't know about fast or slow. Uh, I, in my my opinion is it came down the coast, and it'd be easy to overlook. You know, I mean, if it's just flying, hanging along a beach or a cliff, it'd be easy to overlook. Or maybe people saw, just said, oh, I saw a snowy owl. It's kind of cool. And then because of who you guys are and where you are, it, it raised a different discussion. But if it just showed up on the coast of Seattle, someone say, oh, yeah, it's not. They might tell me a month later, oh, I had a snowy owl at something marsh uh, on this date here. It was the only one I saw all winter. But the fact that it came from California. So uh, that's what I think. I think it just came down the coast, easy to overlook. And then once you find it, I, I suspect it's still here. You, are they commonly seen in Northern California, Oregon, Washington? 
I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't have records for California, Oregon, Washington. I don't keep those records, but I think it's unusual for California. I know there's, there was a Northern California record some years ago, and other people may know that. Oregon, same thing. There was one that actually spent the summer in Oregon a few years ago. Something like this showed up, spent the summer out in the middle of, you know, somewhereville. And, uh, but uh, in the, in the um, Washington area, not unusual for them to come down along the airport, you know, Northern Washington coastal area, and then British Columbia, not unusual also to have snowy owls show up there. How fast they flew, how, I, I don't know that, you know, but, but I think, I think bridges came down the coast. That would be my opinion. And it's just an opinion. Wait, wait a sec, yes. Okay, for the Zoom people, the question is, you know, can it become, you know, acclimated to people and maybe dependent on people, birds that are brought in in captivity can imprint on, on people. I think the imprinting stage is more usually at a younger age where it imprints, so I doubt this bird would happen. Uh, does it become dependent on the people sitting out there? You know, I mean, if it's eating French fries and you're throwing French fries on it, right. But I don't think so, you know. Um, and and, and the, you know, they're very forgiving. You know, you had all these people out there all the time taking pictures. Maybe some people harass it, maybe some not. Um, we harass them during research every three days, uh, but they're super forgiving. We go out there and do our work. Female does this, male does that. We walk away 100 yards. She's back on the nest. She's back hunting immediately. I don't think the presence of all you people here bothered the owl a bit. But I, again, I wasn't here. You know, maybe it kept her from sleeping. I don't know. But um, other than that, I don't. I don't think she's flying around saying, is there a thousand people somewhere that will take a picture of me? You know, uh, I don't think, you know, I, I just think it's all good. I can go over this side. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so for the Zoom people, is it normal for snowy owls to leave the ark? Absolutely, it's normal. Does climate change play a part now as the second half? Yeah, they, they migrate, you know? I mean, some stay up there all winter and, and we have more data on females. Maybe it's because they're bigger and they can withstand the Arctic cold and they can hunt ducks and things like that out there, but they migrate. And so they're, they're a migratory species and whether they leave the breeding area and go east or west, it's still a migration. Does climate change have a role in that? I don't know. Um, if it does have a role, it's probably in the food resources, the lemmings, uh, and that would be the problem. If, if the climate is affecting lemmings and lemming population fluctuations, some people call it cycles. I don't believe in cycles anymore, but nonetheless, population fluctuations, that could affect snowy owls among other species. But uh, yeah, but they're migratory. And so they move south, you know, and, uh, and some stay north, but it's still a migration. They move away from the breeding area and they move out. These females now can move way, way out into the Arctic Ocean, these polynias. And polynias are just open areas of the pack ice where there's upwellings and a lot of seabirds and sea ducks and things like that will spend the winter there in the dark. And the snow owls are known to go in some of these areas. They're also known to go in between islands and coastlines where the water stays open in the Arctic and hunt, you know, we believe anyway, mostly seabirds and sea ducks. Did that help at all? Okay. When the satellite tracking was done, was there any average distance per day they might fly? You know, there's better data now and, and we're not doing that. But when we did that one here, uh, I think she moved 40 miles a day on her 1800 mile journey uh, throughout over to Russia, back to Alaska, up to Canada and stuff like that. But they have better data you know, today and we don't do that. I mean, I'd like to do it. It's just a, a funding issue. Yes. Why did the bird pick uh, the Cypress community? Uh, 
well, there's some nice houses, uh, safe, na safe neighborhood, you know. Uh, I saw walls around a lot of the houses. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I was there today with Melissa and I just racking my brain, why? Then I would look across and I would say, maybe we should stand up on a pole, and look across. Is there something that the owl sees at this level here that we're not seeing from this level? Is it the wind? Is it, you know, I don't know what it is. Why did it pick it? Why did it stay? Why didn't it fly away when we have crowds of people watching it? One, because it's probably young, you know, and they don't know better. Uh, it hasn't been shot, hasn't been shot at yet. Uh, and they're very forgiving. As I said, you know, when we work on them, we disturb them to do research. And they're like the best species in the world to work on because 24 hours of light, they nest on the ground, they're big and powerful. You bother them when you do your research, you walk away. I mean, we're, we time it. We walk 100, 100 yards, 200 yards away from the nest. In one, less than one minute, she's back on the nest. Sometimes I'll walk from here to the wall and I'll lay down and she'll be a little cautious. She'll come in the nest and she'll just stare at me. We'll be laying down looking at each other. They're very, very forgiving. So it doesn't surprise me that she could have cared less about most of you. Yeah, the question is, what about the summer heat if she decided to stay? I, I, yeah, she'll overheat. You know, their, their plumage has been tested in the lab. And they can withstand temperatures, you know, to minus 40 below zero before they have to kick in any kind of shivering to create, you know, warmth and things like that. So at 70 degrees, she was ghoul of flutter and she was hot. I can imagine your, your summer one. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so why is she hunting at night when the books say they hunt by day? During the summertime in the Arctic, there's 24 hours of light. All right. And when you have mouths to feed and a female screaming at you all the time, then you better hunt. All right. So you're hunting whenever you can. Now, in the wintertime, when you're on your own, you're by myself. Gosh, no kids, no this or that. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> night owls, right? No. Um, Norman Smith has done some work with them in Logan Airport in Boston with night vision scopes. He's found some really neat stuff. They, and most of the guys, most of the field researchers, the winter field researchers, and will tell you, they sit on these snowy owls trying to catch them for hours upon hours upon hours. And then as dusk comes, the owls start to wake up, start preening, you know, and then they'll kick cough up a pellet and they go hunting. He's got some neat photographs of them like going down to the restaurants, the back alleys of Boston, pulling up there where the delivery trucks bring the food in and waiting for rats to come out and then killing rats, you know? So yeah, they do a lot of hunting at night. Um, in the Arctic, you know, with the 24 hours of light, and it's all food dependent and situation dependent, uh, but they do get a little more active when the, the light is in the horizon. And so the low light levels, maybe it's greater shadows, maybe that's just their time period. But they're, they're very, they can be very nocturnal, but it's all circumstance related. Are you hungry, not hungry? Do you have a family? Are you a good hunter or not? You know, things like that. But as you saw here, it didn't surprise me at all to hear that at five o'clock, the bird was leaving all the time. Yes. Oh, no. Oh. 
all right, I, I, these guys might help, but I'll give you a little, maybe what I know. You know, I, when I don't do snow owls, I, then, you know, I, I guide nature tours. And um, there's camps that you could send, you know, a seven-year-old to um, 12. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, and so, but there's camps that, you know, you could, you could send someone to, to, you know, maybe foster that interest. And who knows where it goes? Is it birds? Is it mammals? Is it owls? Is it sparrows? I, I don't know. Is it lizards? And so maybe you could do camps or get involved in some of the, you know, you guys must lead birding tours or you must have, you know, weekends when one of the local guides will take everybody out uh, and they have, you know, young kids days. And, and, and you two might talk better on that. Yeah, for me, it was, I don't know how it just happened, you know. I mean, I, I had a misspent youth, which is a whole nother story, you know. And uh, hanging out, being bad, and um, I built a fort in the woods. We used to go do drugs when we were young, and built a fort on Audubon property. Got in trouble, you know, this and that. This woman calls me up, who you know was a very wealthy woman in the, in the area. Calls me up and says. You know that fort. I go, How'd you get my name, lady? You know, I was kind of a wide punk. And anyhow, she uh, said, "What's well, going to be taken down? Audubon's going to take it down." But I wanted to call you and tell you that it had to be done, and we appreciate all your hard work. It's a very nice little cabin. Blah blah blah. If you ever need a summer job, call me. Click. A year later, I needed a summer job. All right. So I drove to this woman's house. Right. I bang on the door, and she comes. This little old lady comes to the door, and is, can I help you? I said, lady, you called me up last year and told me I couldn't have my fort in the woods. And if I needed a summer job, you would hire me. I said, who are you? And uh, I, I, you know, talked to her, she said, okay, I remember now. She says, you know, I have a girls book club meeting right now. Could you bring me two letters of recommendation? So I came back with a letter from a cop and a letter from a truant officer as she told the story. And work on her grounds and I'm on the grounds. This, this is a good story, you guys, so live with it, all right? And so I'm working on the grounds and I see a red-tailed hawk fly over. And she goes, what are you looking at? I go, oh, a red-tailed hawk. She goes, well, how do you know it's a red-tailed hawk? I go, a red-tailed lady, I mean, not that high. So I worked a little bit. She went inside, she came out with a pair of binoculars and we found the hawk again or something like that. Worked on the grounds. A week later I came, the chief Cherokee was outside, which it never was. and and she said, oh, we're going for a ride today. And I go, what, what do you mean? And so I get in the car, there's a pair of binoculars and a Chandler Robbins bird book back then and a seven by 35 pair of Bushnell binoculars. And that was the story. And then I published a paper with her years later. Uh, she didn't see the cover geographic when we were cover geographic. And so anyway, that's all it took was someone to show an interest in someone else. Yeah, and then... It, yeah, and, that, and then boom, I was sold, you know? I mean, that was sold. And I had to use sports to get me into college. Once I get into college, I, I concentrate. So anyway, that's how it works. <laughs>